first round of the Inza House Debate 2024. Um, I'd like to, like Mr. Ganga said, turn off your mobile phones, otherwise it'll be taken. The motion for today reads that cyberbullying is worse than face-to-face -face bullying. Proposing the motion on my left is Sapphire with Case Punjani, Soham Koshal and Soha Punjani. And on my right is those opposing the motion, Kushi Brahmat, Swata Petal and Dr. Rai. Before we commence the debate, let me outline um, our debating procedures, okay? So each speaker will have a standard speaking time of three minutes. At three minutes, we'll hit the desk once, indicating that they have 30 seconds left, okay? Um, the adjudicating panel will award points to speakers for both content and delivery of their presentations. After a long day of school, everybody wants to go home, relax and chill. But imagine reaching your house, opening your device and finding out that you're being harassed online. This is cyberbullying. Cyberbullying knows no boundaries. It knows no areas which are safe for you. Good afternoon, fellow candidates, students of the school and respectable judges. I, K. Spunjani, am here to propose the motion, cyberbullying is worse than face-to-face -face bullying. What is cyberbullying? Cyberbullying is also known as cyber harassment. This is, occurs when, uh, when people use technology to attack others online. This can be in form of um, embarrassing or threatening people online by posting of embarrassing photos or even fake profiles to ruin the credibility of others. Traditional bullying usually happens in places like schools or social gatherings. But this, is, this gives the opportunity for the victims to take solace and take shelter amongst friends and family. Cyberbullying does not, have, does not follow this order. Cyberbullying can happen anywhere, anytime. No matter if you're safe in your own house or you're outside with your friends. That's what makes cyberbullying so much more worse than face-to-face -face bullying. Some people may argue the point that students and people are online chronically. But this is the fact of our lives. We have grown up with technology by our bedsides. We use technology in many different ways to study, to communicate with friends and families across the world. I'm sure most of you do this on a daily basis. But imagine this technology being used to attack you, you and your friends. Other people may say that you, may, can, you can just block or report these people online. But one thing you have to remember, food for thought. I could, right now, if I was bullying someone, I could make an account faster than you can go downstairs, buy a bag of chips from the canteen and eat it. Thank you. I now call upon the first speaker from the from Emerald House to speak. Barack Otieno. You might be wondering who this is. He's one of the two, one of the 2,233 people who have died in Kenya over the past decade as a result of physical bullying. In his suicide note, he evidently stated that he could no longer withstand the constant and physically cruel abuse and finally decided and led him to think that he taking his life was the only and the best option available to him. In his own words, in his very own letter, he stated, and I quote, Remember me as someone who tried to fight, but ultimately lost the battle. Good morning, ev good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kushi Brambat, and I'm here to strongly oppose the motion that states cyberbullying is worse than face-to-face -face bullying. While cyberbullying poses real challenges in today's digital world, it's crucial and important to recognize that face-to-face -face bullying is more damaging simply because it is unavoidable, immediate, and deeply personal. An encounter with one's bully doesn't offer a log-off button, a comfort a victim of cyberbullying does have. Moreover, face-to-face -face bullying has no escape to the physical presence of their bully, threatening body language, or the real possibility of violence. Moreover, the emotional damage inflicted by direct confrontation, humiliation in front of peers, and the proximity to their, 
to their bullies in an environment that is a, they deserve to feel safe in. For example, school or their, your apartment building, which creates a level of fear that goes beyond the screen. On to my last point. The key distinction that makes face-to-face -face bullying far worse than cyberbullying is the real threat and possibility which sim of violence which simply cannot occur online. In situations we're all aware of, we know bullying often escalates beyond words into physical aggression, whether it's shoving, hitting, or severe violence, creating an environment of constant fear and heightened anxiety. Cyberbullying cannot be worse as there is no immediate threat of violence. In conclusion, face-to-face -face bullying wreaks havoc on victims' mental and physical health in ways online harassment cannot. The immediate raw fear of encountering a bully breeds a relentless cycle of anxiety, stripping away someone's sense of safety and self-worth, leaving, leaving long-lasting scars of a moment of cruelty that cannot be blocked, deleted, or ignored. Thank you. I now call upon the second speaker from Sapphire House. Imagine feeling imprisoned wherever you go, not feeling safe in your own house and not knowing where to go and escape. Good afternoon. My name is Soha Punjani and I stand here strongly proposing the motion cyberbullying is more dangerous than face-to-face -face bullying. Firstly, it is immensely difficult to find out whether someone is being cyberbullied. Whereas physical bullying, let's take an example for our school. When there's a physical fight, not one, not two, but the whole school gathers around just to stop them or to gain more information about their fight. This just creates more awareness and this makes them stop. But what about cyberbullying? What if it's one-on-one? -on -one? No one can tell anyone is cyberbullied. Secondly, there's a wide audience. Now, if someone gets bullied in school physically, the audience is just the school. But if you get bullied through social media, the whole world can see you. The whole world can judge you. The whole world can comment on what you're doing. Not only that, there can be escalation of strangers. Strangers can too start bullying you by seeing what is happening through social media. Not only this, but permanent records. Whatever is posted on social media stays on social media and it cannot be permanent, permanently deleted. This leads to psychological impact. You cannot leave this behind. You cannot forget about it as there will be someone around the world keep on reminding you of what you did and why you did. This can also lead to suicide. Not only physical bullying leads to suicide, also cyberbullying leads to suicide. Let's take an example of Megan Meyer. In 2006, she committed, she committed suicide just because of cyberbullying at the age of 13. The worst part about cyberbullying is anonymity. When someone is bullying you behind the screen, you cannot see who that is. That just gives them more advantage as they don't have the fear of getting caught. Take an example of this country. We have police. We have security cameras. Can you imagine if there were no security cameras or no police? There would be such a, crime, such a high crime rate just without getting the fear of getting caught. Secondly, it also makes the bully not face consequences as you don't know who it is and you can't catch them that easily. So, would you want the bully to face consequences or would you just leave them like that to bully another person? Thank you. I now call upon the second speaker from Emerald House. Cyberbullying is undoubtedly a modern challenge, but can it truly compare to the brutal reality of face-to-face -face bullying? Can a few cruel words on screen match the crushing blow of physical assault or the public humiliation of being tormented every day by your peers at school? Today, I, Swata Patad, stand before you to firmly oppose the motion that cyberbullying is worse than face-to-face -face bullying. Firstly, thank you, Soha, for supporting us when you said 
Imprisoned where you go is exactly what someone feels when they're in close proximity to their bully. Now, on to my points. Face-to-face -face bullying inflicts deeper, long-term, physical, and emotional scars because it is intense and intimate and relentless. Victims face daily harassment in environments where escape is impossible, schools, workplaces, or even your own homes. Unlike cyberbullying, which can be avoided by logging off, as Kushi said, face-to-face -face bullying is inescapable. A study by the UK's Department for Education found that victims of in-person bullying are more likely to suffer from chronic anxiety and depression with long-lasting mental health consequences. So, how many of you have been bullied? Hence, proven. Some of you have been face-to-face -face bullied, and that's a fact. And yet, you are anxious to raise your hands in fear of social judgment. In countries like Kenya, especially in boarding schools, face-to-face -face bullying is deeply embedded in, in cultural and institutional systems. In contrast, cyberbullying can often be more swiftly addressed with harmful content removed and bullies banned from platforms. Kenya's 2019 Kenya Institute of Curriculum Development report revealed that 52% of secondary school students have experienced physical bullying, underscoring the severity and pervasiveness of this issue. Physical bullying also disrupts education in ways cyberbullying cannot. According to UNICEF, one in three students globally is bullied at school, with physical bullying being the most common form. In Kenya, where this type of bullying is rampant, a study by Kenya Institute of Policy Research and Analysis found that 23% of students drop out of school due to physical bullying. These students not only lose their education, but also future opportunities for a better life. In conclusion, in-person bullying inflicts far deeper emotional scars and severely disrupts education compared to cyberbullying. Its relentless nature and cultural norms make it more challenging to combat and address effectively. Thank you. I now call upon the third and final speaker from Sapphire House. Ladies and gentlemen, cyberbullying is not something that stops at the gate. It follows you home. I, Soham Koshal. I'm here to point out the clashes between the proposers and the opposers on this topic. As a victim of both cyberbullying and normal bullying in school, I can talk from experience. Firstly, I'd like to say, Sweater, get your points right. You can log out of your account online, but does that stop the bullies from posting hurtful pictures of you on the internet? No, it doesn't. Also, you said, just log off, right? Just stay home, right? Who's forcing you to go to school? No one. Secondly, I would like to address the first speaker, Kushi. You said, physical bullying has immediate effect. Does that make it worse? Online effect is just as bad. What if you're going for a job interview and your boss sees pictures of you? Inappropriate pictures of you. Exactly. Also, you stated that humiliation will only be in front of your peers, which is bad. However, if it's online, everyone can see the pictures, and you're humiliated in front of everyone. <laughs> On to my last point. If someone says something really hurtful and is anonymous on the internet, how do you plan, how do you plan to take action against them? You can't, exactly. <laughs> However, if it's in real life, let's say you're fighting sweater, someone will obviously come and intervene. If you're isolated in a room alone, how is that gonna happen? Suicidal thoughts is a higher chance of death. Thank you very much. I now call upon the third speaker from Emerald House. Good afternoon, judges, students, and my extremely worthy opponents. Today, I stand by you to strongly go against the motion which states cyberbullying is worse than face-to-face -face bullying. To reiterate what my teammates have said, face-to-face -face bullying is harmful and it often leads to physical abuse, which is way worse. Moreover, the physical and the emotional scars often prevent students from getting education and often leave a long-lasting mark on everyone. 
Now, I'd like to rebuttal a few points that my opponent stated. Firstly, I, guys, I really regret that all of us are here and the first speaker and their team fails to understand the basic fundamentals of this debate. So, for the first speaker who doesn't seem to understand what this debate is about, cyberbullying is the use of technology to harass, threaten, embarrass, or target another person. The first speaker said one point about him getting chips as quick as he can. I'm sorry, we're not here to debate about how quickly you can get chips, and we have much more uh, harmful issues but that we need to discuss. Secondly, you said that we feel safe behind this. We don't feel safe in school, or cyberbullying, you're not safe. This is another ridiculous point from their team, as you fail to understand that you're way more safer at home and when you're behind the screen. Now, to the second speaker, who, who yet again made the same mistake and said you're safer when you're in school, which clearly does not make sense. As when you're behind your home, you can easily to talk to people who you're closer to, like your parents, your siblings, or anyone else who's at home. The second speaker also spoke about anonymity and how people may bully you more because of how anonymous they are. This works both ways, as people who are getting bullied behind the screen feel way more confident about themselves, so it works both ways. Then, this for my second speaker in their team, uh, I'm sure you know that social media these days has AI regulations which prevents people from sending hate messages. Uh, so yeah, your point on AI regulation clearly made no sense. Uh, to, finally, to the third speaker, you said you have experience of both physical and cyberbullying. I'm sorry, if you're trying to feel sympathetic, we're not here to debate about personal issues. Sec for, this, for the third speaker, I also want to thank you for sounding as cliche as we thought you would by saying get your facts right. Thank you for sounding cliche. First, you, you spoke about it being, you spoke about the immediate effect. I want you to think about how would you feel if I punch you or if Case posts a picture of someone? What hurts more? What hurts quicker? Thank you. And the third speaker also spoke about being isolated when you face cyberbullying. Yet again, another topic from their team that fails to make sense. When you're isolated, it's when you're at home or you have a device. Uh. The participants will now leave the stage. Uh, the results will be announced after the second debate has been done. So those who are participating in the second debate, please come on stage. The second motion of the day reads that technology is creating more jobs than it eliminates. Um, the proposing side on my left is Hemel Brajapati, uh, Jaskarat Singh and Josh Sumaria, and on my right, is the opposing side, Sanvi, Ruhi, and Kayla. So we'll begin with the proposing side, the first speaker. Technology is the use of scientific knowledge for practical purposes. Examples of technology include this microphone, these speakers, and artificial intelligence. However, as technology has developed further and further and further, people have fallen under the misconception that it has been killing jobs. Good afternoon, all. My name is Josh Sumaria from Class 12G, and today I stand here to strongly propose the motion that technology is creating more jobs than it is eliminating. First of all, creating technology like this microphone or a computer or a smartphone, uh, it's a job in itself. Uh, currently, there are 62 million people in the United States alone who are employed in the computer science sector, and that sector is just growing. Technology has allowed for the invention of the internet, which itself has provided more job opportunities in fields such as cybersecurity and web development. Also, technology uh, is, is, um, allows for cre uh, creation of jobs of specialists. For example, if my mic stopped working here, uh, we would have a specialist help, help us out. There is also an economic argument to be made about, uh, in favor of technology. For example, teachers use projectors and laptops to teach us in class. Uh, this helps us achieve better grades, and this in turn means that the teacher is more productive. 
If the labor force of a country is more productive, uh, this means the economy will undergo, econom undergo economic growth, which creates more jobs. Lastly, apps such as LinkedIn have come along recently. These apps allow users to show their qualifications and achievements uh, to potential employers on the internet. These employers have a larger labor force, uh, labor pool uh, to hire from. This in turn in decreases unemployment and increases employment. I hope that I've convinced you to come over to my side in proposing the motion that technology creates more jobs than it eliminates. Thank you very much. Technology is creating more jobs than it eliminates. At first glance, this motion seems plausible, but we see headlines about tech innovations, new startups, and a promise of economic growth. But this promise is only a fraction of the full story. Good afternoon, all. My name is Ruhi Shah, and I'm strongly opposing the motion, and I'm representing Topaz House. Technology has been, a, has been a driving force for job displacement, inequality, and the erosion of stable employment across many sectors. Let's talk local. We have supermarkets like Cafo, Naivas, and many other, and they all have, like, they've started introducing self-service technology. So customers are able to check out themselves or even like shop online at the comforts of their houses. So this reduces the demand of human cashiers. And since we all know like farms are profit, um, they have a profit motive and they're more inclined to invest on efficient technology. So this helps reduce their cost of production in terms of like wages. And did you know in 2020, Tesco announced a uh, cut of 4,500 jobs which is over 68% of job losses for the retail chain. Secondly, automated teller machines, ATMs, that allow customers to withdraw money, deposit checks, and perform other banking tasks without needing a bank teller. So as, as he said, like, yeah, we have the speakers and all, but there's so many like, other advancements in technology that are helping us today. Major banks like HSBC, have closed over 3,500 branches in the last decade, and it has resulted to more than 80,000 jobs since 2008. Additionally, many customers prefer online banking, where you just download the app and you can just uh, perform your banking transactions from there. And I'm sure everyone in this room either has M-Pesa or like Airtel money on the phone. Thirdly, highways. In Nairobi, we have the expressway. In India, you have a uh, fast tag. So these, they've replaced like manual booth operators. So vehicles just pass through without stopping and the tolls are automatically deducted from the driver's account. Last but not least, if you look at the agricultural side of it, like we have self-driving tractors, drones for crop monitoring, and AI-driven irrigation systems. So these, like, re they replace the manual uh, farming tasks and the uh, farm laborers also. And such innovations not only help developing countries like Kenya, Ghana, Uganda, and such countries like they're developing, so they're uh, mainly re reliant on like primary products. So this really helps them gain international competitiveness. In conclusion, while the opposing side might say that new industries such as like the e-commerce or like the gig economy might create jobs, but these jobs are low-paying and, un and unstable. So they lack the security and the benefits that like, traditional jobs would give you. Yeah, and like, as we all know, like, inflation is rising and like, it's been higher than ever. So with such a low income, it's not sustainable for like, your day-to-day -day expenses and just like a general living. Yeah, thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I, just Jaspiyat Singh, today will strongly propose the motion technology is creating more jobs than eliminating them. I would like to start by adding on something what my uh, teammate said of providing new jobs. It's not only providing new jobs, it's also um, upskilling and reskilling the existing jobs. Now, these innovation and advancements in technology from government and uh, education institutions are improving each sector of a particular industry, providing more jobs within new sectors, increasing the demand of labor. Now, technology also provides complementary jobs. 
Now what I mean is let's say you're working in an electric car company like Tesla. But it's not only the tech uh, sector that's gaining the benefits. It's also the agriculture which are hunting for cobalt. Now cobalt is important, isn't it? Mankind. I firmly believe tech provides more jobs than eliminates them. And these are the reasons why we urge you to support this motion. Thank you. From manufacturing to customers, automation technologies are replacing human workers at an unprecedented rate. Research suggests that this so-called technology is causing the substitution of laborers with machines, driving them out of their employment by a whopping 68%. Of course, a major complaint would be that technology is more of a blessing rather than a curse, which has caused an 85% in employment increase since 1940. But this percentage increase is now leading to our downfall with increased technological incentives. Are we facing a future of stagnant income and worsening inequality? Good afternoon, respected judges, worthy opponents, fellow teammates, and my wonderful, wonderful audience. My name is Sandi Shah from Topaz House, and today, I stand before you to strongly oppose the motion that states technology is creating more jobs than it eliminates. Before I begin, I would like to rebuttal one certain point that one of my fellow opponents mentioned. Microphones. Do you really think that some, when a microphone is dead in the school, they will open it up, fix it, and give you the same microphone? You will get a new one. I will give an example of yesterday. Uh, the lights kept on going off, and a certain someone had to keep on trying to project the voice without a microphone. How reliable is this technology? Technology, technology has detrimental effect on society by not only contributing to job displacement, widening economic disparity, and eroding personal connections. Doesn't that already say it? Moving on to my points. There's always a skill mismatch. As technology evolves, the skill required for many jobs change. Take, for instance, a medical specialist who needs to learn a technological skill that they were never good at at this specific field. So they have to go through hours and hours and hours of tedious and gruesome learning in order to master these skills. But what if they can't? What about, are they supposed to give up? Are they supposed to quit or be fired? Because they cannot cope up with these hard times. Obviously, a basic knowledge about this technology is required to be able to operate these machines. For instance, a probe in your technology. But this is a debate about emerging technologies. Emerging technologies include, but is not limited, to artificial intelligence and machine learning. How is someone who is required to do a grappling eight years of study, study more, so just, just so that he or she can basically survive and earn in what they actually want to do? Estimates show that between 75 and 375 million workers around the world, across all industries, 50% in medicine, might be out of work due to automation by 2030. Moving on to my second point, gig economy pressure. Technology has facilitated, facilitated the rise of gig and freelance work, which is when a worker and a client have no fixed obligation to each other beyond a current project. This not only leads to job insecurity, lack of benefits for workers, and inconsistent income as compared to traditional employment. Although research suggests that technology may lead to skill enhancement, this same research also shows that technology possesses a threat to income growth for these workers. Basically, the abundance of technology deflates wages. Supply chain optimization and outsourcing. Advanced technology in logistics reduces the needs for workers in warehouses and transportation by streamlining Operations. You won't understand technology until you decide to like use it act properly. The microphone basically. Um, good afternoon, my name is Hamil Prajapati and I'm here to strongly rebut to the points made by my opponents. So um, the first speaker, Ruhi, she said that um, since 2008 we have lost around 80,000 jobs in a certain sector. But I mean, with all due respect, please let's use some common sense, right? From the, from the times we didn't have technology, like 20, 30 years ago, we didn't have any social medias, any Microsoft Office things. You can't tell me at that time we had more jobs like compared to today. Of course, from that time, the number of jobs available in any sector have increased. So instead of bringing us back from 2008, please let's look at the net positive growth that has happened over the past 20 or 30 years. On to my second point in the same speaker. Um, she said that she gave all of you an example of M-Pesa and Airtel money and sort of stuff. But like, are you trying to tell me the entire M-Pesa, that long tower, everything is automatic in the office? 
There are no like humans, no people who work in the office. That's not possible, right? Every single person in M-Pesa has a job to do. And that's why it's running today. It doesn't mean like when you send someone money, it's just like everything is happening automatically. Um, on my, to on to my third point, the second speaker, Sanvi. She mentioned about um, people not wanting to learn about new things like technology and everything. But you're only, you're only gonna learn if you like adapt to new technology, right? You can't tell me, okay, like 20 years ago, we never had any Microsoft sort of thing. So like, after, after all that, we did learn about Microsoft, we did learn Word, PowerPoint, and Excel, yeah. Every single person knows how it works. So that's what I'm trying to say, you have to adapt to new technology that comes. You can't just stay like, you can't just stay without technology and say that it's gonna eliminate our jobs. Um, she also talked about skills um, that like increase, you need higher skills to work in medical jobs. I mean, isn't that also better for you, if you think of it? If we have more doctors that are skilled, your operations, your surgeries, they're gonna be of benefit to you, yeah. So that's like, that's good for you, but you're trying to say that technology is eliminating jobs. And I bet that you did use ChatGPT to get your points, 100%, cause yeah, cause I don't really think you understand what gig economy means. Two speakers came over here to talk about gig economy, but none of them have gotten the point right. Gig economy provides flexibility for workers, and many people prefer the ability to choose their work hours and have more autonomy. Furthermore, technological platforms are creating entirely new industries, such as freelancing platforms, content creation, remote work jobs that were previously unavailable. Over time, regulation can address issues of worker benefits and job security as well. Thank you. Hello. Today we confront the assertion that technology is creating more jobs than it eliminates. However, beneath the promise of innovation lies a harsh reality. Automation and digi digitalization displacing millions of workers are pacing the creation of new opportunities and so many other harms that we acknowledge that cyber position does it. Also, we would like to stress on the fact that we want to address good sportsmanship throughout this debate. Allow me to get into the clashes that we've seen throughout. So our first speaker came here and told you about the points such as self-service and tech and ATMs and online banking and agriculture machinery. We're here to stress that this not only works in favor for those in the tech center as of now, but also in the future. Our second speaker came here and said that this skill mismatch, something they completely did not engage with. They came here and they told us various points, but don't worry, I'll get into that. We also came here and we told, that this gig, this, we told you that this gig economy uh, mismatch. We also brought up the points of this disruption in traditional industries, something they also did not engage in. We also brought up the point that the supply chain automizing and outsourcing of workers that are currently existing but won't exist in future simply because of technology. Allow me to get into what they told us and the, and the, and the material that they gave us. So the first speaker came here and told us that the creation of jobs is, is, is going, to, it's going to create more jobs and the tech does that, which we fully acknowledge, however, only within the tech center and those that depend on it. We also want to stress on the fact that new industries require highly specialized skills that, make, that many workers do not possess simply because of, of opportunities and resources that they already lack and they promised to, they promised to give us in the future but they don't show us how we're here to show you that this can lead to structural uh, unemployment and this is extremely dangerous they also brought up the point of gig economy such as LinkedIn and online platforms which we think is an extremely biased opinion to give and only works in their favor we're here to acknowledge brands like Airbnb and Uber who don't have job security who don't have benefits and fair wages something they don't acknowledge and it's not accessible to all the demographics. For example, if I was to tell you that this technology, like they told us, is going to be good, it's going to work, examples like Tesla and so on and so forth, which is extremely irrelevant, we're here to tell you that in places like Zimbabwe or in Zimbabwe will not have the same opportunities as someone who works in San Francisco, California. The second speaker came here and told us that it upskills jobs and job transformation, but we're here to say that job transformation does not equal economic growth and the rate of job transformation is faster than the, av the availability and the effectiveness of reskilling programs that don't even exist right now panel. So let's show you, even if we were to take them at their best case, what does proposition and opposition's work look like? On proposition side, we see job opportunities limited to the tech industry. We see lack of job security. We see uneven economic growth. We see regional disparities. On our side of the house, we provide job security 
job quality and a fruitful economy. Allow me to stress on the point that we do think that tech is good. However, it's overtaking those that exist right now. Yesterday, we were told that somebody wanted to change his course simply because he was not sure that it will exist in the future. In conclusion, while technology can create new jobs and lead to economic growth, it can lead to severe destruction to others. The problem lies in managing this transition effectively. I've never been more proud to oppose this motion. Um, wow. <laughs> you are great debaters, all of you. Can we appreciate... Uh, My job is very simple to announce the winner. First debate, Emerald won. Second debate, Topaz won. Um, finally, the best speaker, Kayla.